Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to worship, both members and visitors alike. A joy to have you here. If you are visiting us by means of Facebook here today, we'd love to know it, and so leave us a comment or like us there on our Facebook page as well. Today we'll be following the order of service that is printed in your service folder, or you can follow along as it is projected in front of you. And you'll see that our theme is, is the truth that we are heirs of God's kingdom through faith in Jesus Christ. And this is an important thing to keep in mind when you consider that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ tells us that as we follow him, we're going to have to pick up our cross and deny ourselves in following him. And when we speak about those crosses, it's not just the, the general hardships that come into our life because we live in a sinful world. No, those crosses are the things that come into our life, the hardships, the difficulties, specifically because we are connected to Christ by faith. If you stop and think about that, one of the ways that we as Christians have to carry a cross is this denying the desires of the sinful flesh. The flesh wants to do one thing, but Christ says, no, this is what you are to do. Well, how in all the world are we going to be able to fight that battle? Well, it's by remembering that through faith in Jesus Christ, that in our baptisms we were connected to our Savior's death and resurrection. It's by that truth that we receive the strength to go out, deny ourselves, take up that cross, and follow him. That'll be our focus as we gather together for worship here this morning. We begin our worship service with the singing of hymn 679. If you are looking for the hymnals, you'll find them underneath your seat or on a chair if you are sitting in one of the black chairs. And we will stand for the singing of the final verse of this hymn. God's blessings on your worship.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. God invites us to come into his presence and worship him with humble and penitent hearts. Therefore, let us acknowledge our sinfulness and ask him to forgive us. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. For all that we need in life and for the wisdom to use all your gifts with gratitude and joy, hear our prayer, O Lord. For the steadfast assurance that nothing can separate us from your love, and for the courage to stand firm against the assaults of Satan and every evil, hear our prayer, O Christ. For the well-being of your holy church in all the world, and for those who offer here their worship and praise, hear our prayer, O Lord. Merciful God, maker and preserver of life, uphold us by your power and keep us in your tender care. Amen. The works of the Lord are great and glorious. His name is worthy of praise. Lord, our Lord. Let us pray. O Lord, our God, govern the nations on earth and direct the affairs of this world so that your church may worship you in peace and joy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. You may be seated. Our first lesson this morning comes to us from the Old Testament book of Zechariah as we read chapter 13, verses 7 through 9. And to help us in understanding these words for a moment, consider this. It is our Lord Almighty who speaks these words. He is speaking to his Son, Jesus Christ, the Good Shepherd. Jesus would be struck as he would suffer and he would die. 
This would cause his disciples to scatter. And what happened with those disciples? Throughout their ministry, throughout their life, they suffered. They bore a cross because of their connection to Christ. And yet, through the words of Zechariah, we see the Lord say that that cross was meant to be a refining fire. That which continued to strengthen their faith to draw them closer to Christ. So that even in the middle of carrying those crosses, they were able to say, the Lord is our God. We read, Awake, sword, against my shepherd. Against the man who is close to me, declares the Lord Almighty. Strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered, and I will turn my hand against the little ones. In the whole land, declares the Lord, two-thirds will be struck down and perish, yet one-third will be left in it. This third I will put into the fire. I will refine them like silver and test them like gold. They will call on my name, and I will answer them. I will say, they are my people. And they will say, the Lord is our God. This is the word of our Lord. Alleluia. Because we are his children, God has sent the spirit of his Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Alleluia. stand for the reading of the gospel. Our gospel lesson from Luke chapter 9, reading verses 18 through 24. Once, when Jesus was praying in private and his disciples were with him, he asked them, who do the crowds say I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, that one of the prophets of long ago has come back to life. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Peter answered, God's Messiah. Jesus strictly warned them not to tell this to anyone. And he said, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law. And he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Then he said to them all, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. This is the Gospel of the Lord. You, you may be seated. We continue with the singing of hymn 861.
I rejoiced with those who said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, those of you in the house of the Lord this morning, grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The portion of God's word that we want to direct our attention to here this morning comes to us from the letter to the Galatians as we read chapter 3, verses 23 through 29. Before this faith came, we were held prisoners by the law, locked up until faith should be revealed. So the law was put in charge until Christ came, that we might be justified by faith. Now that faith has come, we are no longer under the supervision of the law. You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor, nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. This is the word of our God. Has it ever happened to you that somebody comes up to you and asks you, so what is the life of a believer? Or, or how would you describe the life of a believer? On more than one occasion, there have been those who have offered voluntarily their thoughts as to what that is means or what that looks like. And oftentimes, their way of thinking, their answer follows this train of thought. Well, it means trying your best to do what is right, following the golden rule. Is that how you would describe or define it? Well, truth be told, that is not the best way to define and describe the life of a believer. No, the life of a believer is one where that believer returns to the cross of Jesus Christ every single day and lays their sins before their Savior in true, heartfelt repentance. And then, rejoicing and being renewed in the fact and in the knowledge that there on the cross, Jesus died to win forgiveness for all of those sins. And then, having been refreshed and renewed, then going out and striving to put God's will into practice out of thankfulness for this forgiveness that they have received in Christ, all the while knowing that they'll have to be back to that cross again tomorrow. Yes, when you, when you boil it all down, this proper understanding, this description of the life of a believer, only comes when one has a proper understanding of God's law and gospel. And it's this proper understanding of God's law and gospel that that Paul seeks to help us have as we consider these words before us here today. And so he basically says to us, the gospel, it does what the law cannot. Now, this letter to the Galatian churches was one that the Apostle Paul wrote because the believer's faith there in those churches was under attack. You see, during Paul's first missionary journey, he went throughout the area of Galatia, and he proclaimed the message of Jesus Christ as Savior of the world. And by the power of the Holy Spirit working through that word, many people came to faith, and so churches popped up in many of these cities. But after the Apostle Paul left, false teachers made their way into some of these churches, and they sought to distort the truth. And they were saying things like this. Jesus, well, he's good, he, he's necessary, but just simply believing in him, you can't imagine that you'll be saved just like that. If you really want to be saved, well, then you need to obey these laws and these rules, and you need to follow these customs and these regulations. This was a serious problem. 
It took the message of salvation by grace alone, through Christ alone, and, and really basically threw it out the window. It took the unconditional gospel and it made it conditional. And if this false teaching was not checked, it would destroy saving faith. And you know, this, this battle that the Apostle Paul had to, to fight against these false teachers, it's a battle that you and I have to fight against ourselves to this very day. You see, from the moment that we were born into this world, we were born with this idea that we have to do something to get right with God. Within our sinful nature, every single one of us, even to this very day, this thought still exists. That if I want to get to heaven, I need to start living a better life. And so all of the focus is on what an individual does rather than on what Christ has accomplished. So in order to counteract such a soul-destroying, a faith-wrecking thought, we need the words of our lesson here today. And as the Apostle Paul begins, we see that he begins with a very vivid picture. He says, Before this faith came, we were held prisoners by the law locked up until faith should be revealed. Now, when the Apostle Paul says, before this faith came, he's talking about a faith in a Jesus who has come. It's a reference to Jesus Christ, the object of our faith. What Paul is saying is that before we were brought to faith in Jesus Christ as our Savior, we were prisoners of the law. We were thrown in jail, locked up, and the key was tossed away. Not a very pretty picture, is it? And, and doesn't that then also lead to this conclusion? If, if that's the case, when it comes to the law, certainly we do not want to base or rest our hopes of being right with God on obeying the law, now do we? Certainly we do not. Because the law cannot save anyone. No, instead, the law holds as a prisoner all of those who sin. The law says to the sinner, you have sinned. You can't save yourself. I mean, just, just look, the law says. Here, these are the things you're supposed to be doing, and you don't do them. These are the things you are not supposed to do, and yet you continue to do them. And it doesn't take long, does it, to take a look at our lives to see how true that is? Consider, did you speak at all in a way this past week to make another person look bad? If you did, then you broke the Eighth Commandment, and the law says you must be punished. Did you disobey your parents or talk back to them? Did you disregard a law of the land like the speed limit? Well, then you broke the Fourth Commandment, and the law says you must be punished. Are you less than content with something that God has allowed into your life so that you grumble and you complain and you're angry at God? But then you broke the seventh and the ninth and the tenth commandment and the law says you must be punished. Have you arranged your life so that God is first in all of your thoughts, in every single action, if not, you've broken the first and the greatest commandment. And the law says you must be punished. In the verse right before the words of our lesson, the Holy Spirit inspired the Apostle Paul to write this. The scripture declares that the whole world is a prisoner of sin. There is no escaping it. The law is the jailer who holds in custody the one who sins so that they recognize the true and they become aware of the true reality of their sin and the liability of punishment. But why? Why in all the world does the Apostle Paul emphasize this so much? Well, remember 
what he was counteracting. There were these false teachers who were coming into the congregation saying, Jesus isn't enough. You've got to do something. So Paul says, no, it's not going to work. Why do we still emphasize it so much here today? Because let's be honest, truth be told, we still find ourselves slipping into the mindset that says, well, my works must play some part in my salvation, right? If we're honest with ourselves, there are still those times that we find ourselves thinking that we've kept the law well enough that we have earned or we should receive some of God's favor and grace because look at what I've done. It's the reason why there are still those times that we sometimes think that we are more deserving of God's grace and favor than somebody else. But the law comes to us today and it comes to us every day and says, no, you're not any better. You are just like everybody else. You are the worst of sinners. If you have broken one single law, you've broken all of them. If you have failed to be perfect in every way, and maybe it's just even one way, if we could possibly say that, you have failed to be perfect as God demands, and you are a prisoner. The law locks us up in the dungeon of despair and says, just try and get out. The law places before us an impossible task. Be perfect and holy as God demands. But of ourselves, we cannot offer to God the spotless life that he demands. We cannot get out of that prison on our own. On our own, we are doomed. On our own, we are locked out of heaven. That's what the law does. The law convicts. It does not save. To drive that point even further home, Paul gives this illustration. The law was put in charge until Christ came that we might be justified by faith. Now, in, in Greek culture, it was quite common to have a very important slave in the household be one who was in charge of making sure that a child got to school and then got back home from school and did all of their lessons. You could say that they were a chaperone or a guardian. Paul says that's what the, the law is. The law watches over our outward behavior. It provides moral supervision. It governs every aspect of our lives, but it does not save. It was never intended to. The law and its intent is to show us the seriousness of our sin and just how sinful we are and how desperately we need a Savior. Then, then the gospel can come in and do what the law cannot do. You see, that's what the Apostle Paul wants us to see. So he goes on and says, you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. But maybe you're saying, well, me? You? Sons of God? How can this be? Didn't we just say that we are all prisoners because of our sin? And doesn't our sin make us slaves to Satan? How is it that the Apostle Paul now can say that we are sons of God? Well, the answer is found in those marvelous words that he says next. You are all sons of God. Why? Uh, through faith in Christ Jesus. And, and why is that? For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. You see, when we made our first appearance into this world, we were spiritually naked. We were 100% sinful flesh. We were wearing the clothing that Adam passed down to us. And what is that clothing? Sin and death. And that sinful nature, it is thoroughly corrupt. It places us under the control of Satan. It is full of sinful filth and even hatred towards God. But at our baptisms, we put on new clothes when we were baptized into Christ. At our baptisms, we received a change of relationship. 
And to understand this point even more fully, maybe, maybe we can use an illustration. Think about what takes place when you purchase a car from somebody who, who owns it and they're privately selling it. When you go there, they bring out the title, right? And, and their name is on the title. But then you purchase the car. What happens? You write your name on the title. title. It has been sold into your name. Well, at our baptisms, that's what took place. When we were baptized into Christ Jesus, we were brought into the family of God, and God put his name on us. And he could do that because he didn't just sweep our sins under the rug and say, well, I'm going to try to ignore them. No, instead, his justice demanded a whole lot more. His justice demanded that sin be paid for. His justice demanded that punishment be made and exacted for that sin. But instead of exacting a pound of flesh from us, the ones who committed the sins and sending us to an eternity in hell, Jesus Christ came into this world and gave his life as the ransom price to pay for our sins. Christ lifted us out of the devil's grasp by taking our sin and our guilt upon himself and paying for it once and for all on the cross. He crushed the power of Satan when he rose victorious from the grave. He provides us with the righteousness that we need by his perfect obedience to God's law. And now, because we are baptized into Christ, we are covered with his robe of righteousness. We could say that we wear Jesus. His forgiveness, his salvation, his righteousness, his holiness, his life. And through faith, all of this becomes ours, and we believe it. So now, when God looks at us who believe in Jesus Christ, he sees his son's righteousness and not our scars of sinfulness. And ultimately, that's what faith is. Faith faith is saying, God, please don't look at me for who I really am and what I have really done. Because if you look at me, For who I really am and what I've really done, all you are going to see is guilt and unworthiness and sin, and you will have to punish me in hell. No, instead, look at me as you look at your son. See his righteousness as my righteousness, his holiness as my holiness, his life as my life, his death as my death. Look at me through your son and see me as you see your son. And he does. Not because we have earned or deserved it. Not because somehow throughout our life we've proved ourselves to be a little bit better than we used to be. Not because we tried our hardest. No, but because of his grace. In faith, we simply receive what he has so graciously given a robe of righteousness, and membership into God's family. And ladies, a a, a specific word for you here this morning, too. You may have heard before that the Apostle Paul says you're all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. He's not excluding you. He's not seeking to be sexist when he uses those, those words in that term. You see, he purposely used sons of God because he's emphasizing an inheritance. You see, in in the Jewish culture, it was the son who received the inheritance. It was the son who had a special relationship with the father and had access to all of his resources. And so what Paul is saying is that every single believer, whether young or old, male or female, Chinese or American, Every single one are in line for a full reception of a full share of the inheritance. What's that inheritance? Forgiveness and salvation. Think about that, dear brothers and sisters in Christ. For those of you 
who through faith in Jesus Christ know him as your Lord and Savior. That's how God sees you. Righteous. And that's how God wants you, through Christ, to see yourself. So, what is the best way to describe that life of a Christian? That way that a believer is going to live? Well, as a believer, I am saddened and frustrated and repulsed by the sin and evil that I see in this world. But even more so, I am especially repulsed and saddened by the sin that I see in my very own life. It disgusts me. I hate it. I want no part of it. I cannot willingly participate in it. And yet, sadly, sometimes I do. More often than I'd like to admit. And that's not okay. I don't have some sort of license to do whatever I want. There's no excuse for sin. And that's why every single day I need to run back to that cross and admit my sin and my guilt. To confess my unworthiness and my helplessness. And then rejoice fact that there on the cross, God, my Savior, true man, who came to be my substitute, died to pay for every single one of those sins. I rejoice in the fact that God no longer sees my sin because they are covered in the blood of Jesus Christ. And I live in the joy and the peace this forgiveness brings. And then being renewed and refreshed and re-energized, I go out into the world and into my life saying no to sin because Jesus said yes to being my substitute and dying for me. And dear fellow believer, you do the same. Amen. And now the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard and keep your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We join together in confessing our Christian faith with the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty.
Please stand for prayer. Lord, you inspired the psalmist to write, Your word is a lamp for my feet and a light for my path. It is so true. Your word is profound, so enlightening. Yet so often we take it for granted. As we study and hear your word, may it be as if we hear you in our room talking to us. May we find you revealing your will for us in the law, which shows us our sins and convicts us that there is no way to save ourselves. Show us that we need your help to live as we should. Then with your gospel, lead us to see our deliverance from sin and obtain the righteousness only Jesus gives. As long as we live, may we never cease to be thrilled by your life-giving word. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you that you have brought Jessica Jane and John Lechner successfully through their surgeries. In these days of recovery, strengthen their bodies and souls. Continually grant them speedy and successful progress in their recoveries. Give them patience and remind them, assure them, and show them that your grace is sufficient for them. Move them to daily lift their eyes to the cross of Christ their Savior and gain their strength from him who said, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. And Almighty God, we commend to your care Kathy Morgan as she undergoes surgery this week. Thank you for blessing doctors and medical workers with the skills they have. Bless their work so that Kathy may enjoy relief and recovery from her affliction. With confidence in your faithful love, we place her into your hands. And with joy in your promises, we come to you in the prayer you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Praise to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In love, he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. He sends the Holy Spirit to testify that we are his children and to strengthen us when we are weak. Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be praise and thanks and honor and glory forever and ever. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Christ, Lamb of God, take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. Oh, Christ, Lamb of God, take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. 
You may be seated. Our congregation practices what we speak of as close communion. This is where the Bible comes to us and teaches that those who receive the sacrament together with one another are expressing a unity of faith. Since we can only know if this unity exists by an individual's public confession because we cannot nor do we seek to read anybody's heart, we invite those who have expressed that unity with us by membership within our congregation or within our Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Synod to come forward to receive the sacrament with us here today. As you personally prepare yourself to receive that sacrament, you may find the inside cover of the red hymnal to be a benefit to you. Please come forward at the direction of the usher for all is now prepared.
Please stand. We join together in the song of thanksgiving that we find on page 16 in the service folder. Hear the prayer of your people, O Lord, that the lips which have praised you here may glorify you in the world, that the eyes which have seen the coming of your Son may long for his coming again, and that all who have received in his true body and blood the pledge of your forgiveness may be restored to live a new and holy life through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another and serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you peace. Amen. 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 You may be seated for our final hymn. Truly, what a joy it is to be able to know what it is that the life of the believer is like. Because of our baptisms and our baptism into the death and resurrection of Christ, we have been clothed with Christ. We wear his robe of righteousness. It is that robe of righteousness, it is that faith that has been created in us 
that leads us to recognize that the life of the believer is one that comes back to the cross each day, that lays our sin before our Savior, but knowing that Christ took every single one of those sins and suffered the penalty for them for us. This inspires us, this moves us, this motivates us to go into our lives to strive to put his will into practice. Not because we're trying to earn anything from God, but because we know we already have everything from God through Christ. Forgiveness, salvation, righteousness. And then recognizing that we'll be back at that cross again tomorrow to receive that forgiveness and that strength to do it all over again until finally we reach glory where we won't have to worry with, about sin anymore. A joy to, to worship with all of you here this morning. Once again, that very special welcome to those of you who are visiting with us today. Um, we would love to know that you have joined us, so if you would, take a, a moment to sign our friendship register that you find in the gathering area. You'll find it on the square table. Also, please feel free to stick around for some, some coffee, some cookies, some fellowship after worship as well in our fellowship hall. Um, to draw your attention to just a couple of announcements here before we, we close, and that is, please take note that starting next week, Sunday, we will be beginning a sermon series, a summer sermon series on the Ten Commandments. And in, con in connection with that, we will also be having a Bible study on the commandment that we look at during our Sunday morning worship service. So starting next week after our, our worship service at 11 o'clock, we will take a look at at, at really God's law and, and the first commandment as well. So please feel free and you are encouraged to stick around for that. Um, youth, take note, we'll have a youth group meeting for our, our Bible study and, and games next Sunday at 1 o'clock. Um, then also take note that our joint worship and picnic is coming up here rather quickly, the 23rd of June. Um, that will be held at our Black River Falls campus this year. And once again, meat, buns, condiments, drinks, and chips are going to be provided that day. But if you are able to, um, we would love to have you bring either a salad or dessert for that day. Um, everything else is also still important, but I'm not going to touch on every single one of those points. Please take a look at it yourself. Um, see which ones apply to you. God's richest blessings to all of you, and God be with you till we meet again.